Western Europeans were first introduced to Damascus steel around the 3rd and 4th centuries from the historical trading center of Damascus, the capital of Syria. While there are examples of this material being produced in the city of Damascus, its technical and physical origins are from India and the Middle East. It is likely that the original Damascus steel was produced from Wootz steel, an alloy developed in southern India that can be created by melting pieces of iron and steel with charcoal in an atmosphere without oxygen. Once the steel was introduced to Damascus, Syria, the weapon industries thrived between the 8th and 17th centuries. However, the process used to make these patterned swords was lost around the mid-1700s. The swords made from Damascus steel have complex surface patterns and sharpness. According to legend, the blade of one of these swords could cut a piece of silk in half as it falls to the ground, and can maintain its edge after cleaving through stone, metal, or even other swords. But since the techniques for making these swords have been lost for hundreds of years, no one is sure exactly why these swords are so exceptional. The loss of this technique is most likely due to the breakdown of trade routes between India and the Middle East. Because of differences in raw materials and manufacturing techniques, modern attempts to duplicate the metal have been unsuccessful. As remarkable as Damascus steel is, its quality is surpassed by high carbon steels produced today via the 19th century Bessemer process. Damascus steel is used for many different weapons and knives. Back in 6th century AD, Norwegian smiths were masterfully producing pattern welded blades while the use of wood steel was also occasionally used. They made many long bladed weapons out of Damascus steel, the main one being long swords used in battle. They were costly and expensive to produce but they were of high quality. The most common way Damascus steel is used today is in knife blades. The process today of choosing steel for a Damascus blade is important. You want to choose the strongest formation of the steel. A common form today is all stainless Damascus. It has high contrast, double high carbon, and many exotic patterns. When it comes down to it, most of today's super exotic alloys will outperform any pattern welded steel. Owning and using a Damascus blade is about personal style and respect for the time and process of developing such a blade. A well-made Damascus blade will stay sharp for longer than most production quality knives. Damascus steel knives are still made today because they are of high quality and can stay sharp, but that does, that does not mean they are the best knives to choose from. Outside of blades, Damascus is used occasionally with gun making. Prior to the early 20th century, all shotgun barrels were forged by heating narrow strips of iron and steel and shaping them around a mandrel. This process was referred to as laminating or Damascus. Current gun manufacturers make slide assemblies in small parts such as triggers and safeties for pistols from powdered Swedish steel resulting in a swirling two-toned effect. These parts are often referred to as stainless Damascus. So Damascus today is used mainly for knife blades and occasionally guns. Why do blades of Damascus steel have such a mythical status compared to blades of other metals? Aside from loss of technique and the subsequent unobtainability of the original steel, Damascus' legendary status comes from its combination of many desirable qualities and superiority to many contemporary and modern metals. Blades made of Damascus steel are exceptionally tough and shatter resistant, hold an edge very well, and have a distinctive and beautiful pattern in the metal. All of these properties are dependent on the forming process and the resulting micro-constituents. Analysis of Damascus steel shows that it is a hyper-eutectoid, ultra-high carbon steel, with a carbon content of approximately 1.6 weight percent. This means that as it is cooled, it will form a perlite matrix with cementite grains. The cementite particles in Damascus steel are unique in that they are very small and not uniformly distributed. Instead, they are gathered in sheets that are spread throughout the metal. This is a result of the flattening of the austenite grains during forging and leads to the characteristic Damask pattern which is even more apparent when the sample is etched to emphasize the grain boundaries. It also leads to increased hardness and strength, as the cementite sheets help to prevent dislocations from occurring. The cementite structure also benefits from the composition of the Wootz metal used to make it. During the forming process, impurities in the ores help to catalyze the formation of carbon nanotubes inside the cementite, further increasing the strength of the material. Perlite, however, is not very hard, and so to increase the hardness of the metal overall, it is reheated to just above the eutectoid temperature, allowing the perlite to return to the austenite region without affecting the cementite particles. This also happens to be the temperature range where ultra-high carbon steels are super plastic, 
Working the steel in this region can prevent it from becoming brittle by interrupting the formation of iron carbide networks, keeping grain size small to allow sliding among the grains. After being formed, the metal is then quenched and tempered, turning what was once perlite into martensite, a much harder microconstituent. The result is a blade composed of very fine grains of martensite and cementite, making it strong and hard while not being susceptible to brittle failure. Layers of iron and steel are welded together and then forged and bent over one another. Safety first. This is the finished product of the Damascus steel. The powder that you saw during the video was a flux that we assume is borax, and the flux is used to keep the impurities away from the weld. Oh boy, I can't wait to eat this chicken. If this were Damascus steel, this wouldn't have happened. Two, one.